Good morning. Uh, it is a joy to get to worship with you this morning. I'm so thankful for our team who's led us so far. I just want to invite you, if you have a Bible with you, to turn over to Hebrews chapter 4 as we continue our time walking through uh, this amazing letter, this amazing book of Hebrews. And like Pastor Mike said, we're kind of coming into a kind of a pivot point uh, as we're walking through this book together. We've been talking about how Jesus is the better rest. Uh, and then beginning today and in the weeks ahead, we're going to be talking about how Jesus is the great high priest. And this is such an important theme in the book of Hebrews. It began as we already kind of prayed through Hebrews 2. It begins there and then it picks up here at the end of chapter 4 and in chapter 5. And then really, as you go through chapters 7 through 10, it's going to be a predominant theme of the book. And so one of the joys of what we kind of get to do this morning is over the next several weeks, we're preparing our hearts, not just around this idea of Jesus as the great high priest or better high priest, but Jesus as the great high priest, setting our hearts toward Easter uh, that's coming just a few weeks from now. And so I'm so excited for us to be able to dive in and to pursue that together. And I just want to encourage you, uh, if you are here and you are in the reading plan, you've been involved in the series, just keep going with us. Even today, as we walk through this passage, we're going to be pulling from the Old Testament a lot to kind of unpack and understand what's happening here. And if you've not jumped into the reading plan or maybe you kind of were in but fell off, this is a great place to get back involved. As we go through the Old Testament in our reading plan along the book of Hebrews on the weekends, it gives us context for the things that we're studying today. So I just want to invite you to be a part of that with us. And so as we come into chapter 4 and, and kind of round out the chapter, and so I was kind of preparing for this weekend, there, there are two words that kind of were on my mind and on my heart, just kind of preparing to be able to open God's Word with you this morning. Those words are wait and wonder. Wait and wonder. As we've been going through Hebrews 3 and 4, there is a lot of wait. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart as on the day of the rebellion. We've heard that refrain again and again and again and again. This warning that the propensity of the human heart is to harden itself against God. And as we come into our passage this morning, what I want to do is, this morning our text is in verse 14 on, I want to kind of go back a little bit to where Pastor Mike led us through last week, starting in verse 11, because it sets up the wonder. We have to understand the weight if we're going to understand the wonder. And so verse 11 says this of chapter 4, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So it's weight. Strive to enter the rest so you don't fall. We don't want to fall into unbelief. We don't want to fall into disobedience. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intention of the heart. So not only do we want to strive that we would not fail to enter that rest, but the Word of God, the, the written Word of God, and the incarnate Word of God, Jesus Christ, together they pierce to our soul, that they expose us that our thoughts, our desires, our intentions, they are brought out before God. That is weighty because if you're anything like me, when you get to the root of our heart, there's a lot of ugly things there. But not only that, he goes on and says, verse 13, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So not only do we worry about unbelief and not entering into rest and falling into disobedience but the word of God reveals our heart to the full but not only does the word of God open us up and expose the very intention of our heart it says in verse 13 that you and I all of us all humanity we will give an account you might say man pastor Paul it's heavy I, I know like that's the weight as we've gone through chapter 3 and chapter 4 up to this point it is a weighty heavy thing on our own, in our best efforts, by our best deeds, in pursuit of our best worship, we all fall short. 
But the good news this morning, it's not just wait, it's wonder. And this is what we're going to lean into over the next several weeks together. We've, we've seen, we've felt the heaviness, the weight of our sin, our brokenness. But over the next few weeks, we get to see the wonder of what God has done to step into our weight, step into our brokenness. Look at verse 14 with me. Since then, we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, with confidence, not, not wondering, but there is a confidence in Christ, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Amen? The wonder God has made a way to rescue us in the weight of our sin, and that way is through a great high priest. Chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, verse 5, Christ, talking about Jesus, did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Quoting from Psalm chapter 2. And as he also says in another place, Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Wait and wonder, wait and wonder, the weight of our brokenness, the weight of our unbelief, the weight of our propensity to be hard-hearted, the weight of our propensity to be deceived by sin, and the wonder that God has sent Jesus to be our great high priest. And that is our big truth this morning and the weeks ahead. Jesus is the great high priest. Jesus is the great high priest. And so what we have the joy of being able to do this morning is to begin unpacking what this means. What does it mean for Jesus to be the great high priest? And then we will have the joy of responding by celebrating through the Lord's Supper, remembering our high priest's death in our place. And so, in order to really grab hold and understand the beauty, the wonder, the depth, the richness of these verses, we have to take some time to talk about what is a high priest? What does it mean for Jesus to be a high priest? Because my guess is for most of you this morning, if you know, you're regular in church, you believe in Jesus, so when I make this statement, Jesus is the great high priest, there's probably not very many people in the room who'd say, no, he's not. Like, most of us are probably on the same page. Like, okay, I can get my mind around that. Like, I can agree with that statement. Like, the Bible says it, I believe it, you know, we're good, I got it. But what I want to remind us this morning is there's a difference between agreeing with something or believing something than fully understanding it, right? So let me just give you an example. Let's say that I invited Pastor Daniel to come join me up on stage and I explained to him the law of gravity. You know, this is what it is, this is how it works, do you believe it? Well, he's probably going to say, yes, I believe that truth, that makes sense to me. But it would be different if I explain it to him versus if I just push him off the stage and say, gravity. In both situations, he's going to believe it. But in one of those situations, he's going to understand it a little bit differently, right? And I wouldn't do that, I'm a nice guy. He might do that to me, I wouldn't do that to him. But there's a difference between agreeing with something, even believing something, versus understanding it. And so this morning what we want to do together is walk through what is a high priest and why is that significant to you and me living in East Tennessee in 2023? Why are we talking about high priests? Is that's just kind of an Old Testament thing, Bible terminology. Why does that matter to you? How does that change the way that you go to work tomorrow? How does that affect the way that you parent? How does that affect the way that you engage with your spouse after this is over? 
Why are we spending the time talking about great high priests? How is the great high priest an answer to all of these problems of not entering rest and unbelief? In order to understand the fullness, the wonder, the beauty of Jesus being the great high priest, we have to take some time to unpack the context. The context. And if we just had time this morning, we would just read. And I would encourage you to go back in your Bible. If you've been through the reading plan, you've read this already, but you go back and review Exodus chapter 28 and 29 explain the role of the high priest. Leviticus chapter 4 and Leviticus chapter 16 specifically talk about the way the high priest serves the people through sacrifice. And those passages, while they are unfamiliar for most of us, like we might kind of know they're there, to this audience, they knew these texts. They knew the history. They knew the law. They knew the role of the high priest. And so when the author of Hebrews begins talking about Jesus being the greater high priest, they are leaning in. Because the high priest is so significant to the Jewish culture and understanding and beliefs. For Jesus to be greater than all the other high priests, for him to even be greater than Aaron, the greatest of all the high priests, significant. So what I want to do this morning and next week and as we move into these weeks ahead is really try to answer two questions. Why is the high priest significant? And two, how is Jesus the great high priest? How is he the better high priest? Why does that matter for you? Why does that matter for us today as a church family? So just several big ideas this morning, kind of unpacking some of the specific things about the high priest. And we're going to spend a lot of time in chapter 5 this morning because he lays this out more in chapter 5 than chapter 4, but we'll circle back to chapter 4 by the end of our message this morning. So first big idea is this. Why is the high priest significant? Several big ideas. First one, the high priest is chosen by God. The high priest role is significant because it is chosen by God. God. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. That means that the high priest is not self-selected. This is not someone who's rising up and taking power. It's not something that can be dictatorial. It's not something that's done out of might or personal ambition. They are chosen. They are selected. But it's important, not selected by the people. This is not democratic. This is not a popularity contest. They are chosen by God. And this is clarified in verse 4 of chapter 5. He says, And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So this is important. The high priest is significant because it is a role, a person chosen by God for the people. It's not something that they're voted into. It's not something that they take control over themselves. It is something that only happens by the choosing the work of God. And when you read through the Old Testament, every high priest that's there, it's one that is chosen by God, set apart by God. That's significant for us this morning. And he gives a positive example of that, and we see that in Aaron. I just want to read from Exodus 28, verses 1. We see this here. God said this, Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, for among the people of Israel to serve me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And then Aaron was called to be the high priest. So his sons were priests. There were many priests. There were many Levitical priests in Israel, but there was only one high priest. Aaron was the first high priest chosen by God. Again, this is not something that he chooses, this is something that God chooses. In fact, there's examples in Scripture of people trying to make themselves priests. We've read about one already in Numbers, one was in Korah. And Korah and Korah's family, they took the censers, they tried to act as priests, and the ground swallowed them whole. Then there's another example that you can look at in 2 Chronicles, and it talks about King Uzziah. And King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26, he goes into the temple, he takes the censer, he wants to offer sacrifices as a priest, and God breaks him out in leprosy for trying to take this role that he's not been given, that you can't become the priest on your own, it's something that only God can do. The high priest is chosen 
by God. Second big idea why the high priest is significant is this. The high priest is simultaneously one of the people, a servant of the people, and the representative of the people before God. Now that's a mouthful, so let me just say that again. The high priest is simultaneously these three things. He's one of the people, servant of the people, and the representative of the people before God. So let's just break that down for a moment. One, he's one of the people. What does that mean? He's a normal human being. He's a normal person. He's not a superman. He's not super religious, more so than everybody else. He's a normal person with normal temptation and normal weakness. Look at what it says in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 5. For every high priest, he is chosen from among men. That means he is a man. Is appointed to act on behalf of man in relation to God, to author gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 2, this is important, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. Why? Since he himself is beset with weakness. He was a normal person, full of weaknesses, facing temptation. Not only that, verse 3, because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for the people. So the high priest was not sinless because he was human, because he was a man full of weakness. Before he could go in and offer sacrifices on behalf of the people before God, he had to offer sacrifices for himself. He's a normal human being, full of weakness, facing temptation. But not only is he one of the people, secondly, he serves the people. He is called to serve those who are ignorant and wayward and those words ignorant and wayward are important because what the author is doing here is he is looking at a different subset of people than the people he's been talking about in chapter 3 and chapter 4 so the hard-hearted unbelieving person that's a different group than the people he's talking about here the ignorant and the wayward the hard-hearted and unbelieving are those who have not fully trusted in God They might be among the people of God, around the people of God, but they have not followed God by faith, as we've talked about the last several weeks. The ignorant and wayward, that's that's a different category. It's a category of people who are following God, but are in need of God's help. They might be ignorant because they lack knowledge. They're baby Christians. They're immature in the faith. And they are wayward, they walk away from obedience, they sin, they fall because of their lack of knowledge, their lack of understanding. For some of you in this room, that's where you are, and that's not a bad thing. You're a baby Christian, you're immature, you don't have a lot of knowledge about the faith, and so you tend to be wayward. And to you this morning, I just encourage you, we want to help you grow up. That's what the church is meant to do, to help one another grow up. For some, ignorance is due to lack of pursuit. I think this is a lot of us in the church like we have knowledge we've been around the truth we're trusting Jesus but we're not walking in obedience to the truth we're not walking in abiding pursuit and so in our ignorance we become wayward our hearts are prone to wander we lose sight of our savior for others that ignorance is due to distraction The cares of this world, the business of our life, the things in our career and our kids have taken our focus, our gaze off of Jesus. He's no longer our greatest attention. Which leads to ignorance, which leads to waywardness. That's some of us in the room. Then for others in the room, it's an ignorance due to sin. For some of us, there's some sin strongholds in your life that just have you. Whether that's greed, whether that's pornography, anger, fear, anxiety, those things that have just taken you captive, which make you ignorant, which make you wayward. And for many of us, we're in multiple of those categories. You're like, check all of the above. Which is why you and I, we need a high priest. Because not only is the high priest one of the people, he serves the people, but third, and this is 
one of the most important ones, the high priest represents the people. He represents the people. He goes before God on behalf of the people. He is one of them, but he represents the whole nation, the whole people before God. Verse 1 of chapter 5, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to do what? Act on behalf of men in relation to God. It was the role of the high priest to come before God on behalf of the people. In fact, in Exodus 28-29, it talks about how the high priest would literally wear this robe, this breastplate, that had 12 stones on it, each stone with the name of the tribes written. So he would walk into the presence of God with the names of the people over his heart. And he would represent the nation, all the people in their ignorance, in their waywardness before holy, holy, holy God. And so the high priest is significant because he's chosen by God, but the high priest is also significant because he stands before God on behalf of the people. Which leads to the third big idea. Third, we see the high priest also is significant because he has access to God's presence. Access to God's presence. See, all of life in Israel was meant to be centered around the presence of God. The way they arranged their camp was in this massive kind of circular formation with the tabernacle at the center. That as the people went, they went by a cloud, a fire by day, or a pillar by night. And it was a symbol of God's presence leading the people. Everything revolved around God's presence. They were to be God's people, which meant their, God's presence was to be among them. In Exodus 29, 45-46, it says, I will dwell among the people of Israel. I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And so God's presence would be manifest at the sanctuary that God's people could see his presence at the tabernacle but they couldn't go in. They couldn't go into God's presence because of their sinfulness. Only one could go in. One time of year, and guess who that was? It's the high priest. That the priest, they could enter into the outer part of the sanctuary, but in the holy, holy, most holy place, there's only one that could enter into that place before the presence of God, and that was the high priest. All of life, God's people were centered around his presence. However, God's people could never enter his presence due to their brokenness and sin. Only the high priest, as the only human who could enter into God's presence on behalf of the people. We'll look at this more in Hebrews 9, but in Hebrews 9, it talks about this. It talks about how the Holy of Holies, the high priest, was the only one one day a year who could go into that place on behalf of the people before God as a mediator between God and man. And the high priest never went just by himself, he always went with an offering before God. Which leads to a fourth big idea this morning. The high priest offers sacrifices of thanksgiving and atonement for sin on behalf of the people. So the high priest, he's chosen by God. He's a representative of the people. He's one of the people. He enters into God's presence. What does he do? He brings offerings, sacrifices, an atonement for sin. There's kind of two parts there. First, he leads the people in sacrificial worship. He would bring grain offerings and fruit offerings and animal offerings. And all of these offerings were God's people giving of their best, their best sacrifices back to God to worship him. See, God is worthy of our best worship. And the high priest would bring these offerings, these unblemished animals, these unblemished offerings as gift, as worship to God. And that's a lot of what Leviticus is. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to read through some of those Old Testament passages, but it talks about these offerings of worship to God. The high priest would lead the way in guiding the people in the worship of holy, holy God. However, these sacrifices were never sufficient because... They were tainted by sin and the sinfulness of the people. 
which is why not only would they, he would bring sacrifices of thanksgiving, but also sacrifices of atonement for sin on behalf of the people. God's people could never perfectly obey the law, just like we cannot. The high priest would offer an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people. Again, verse 1. For every high priest chosen among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to do what? Offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. And not just for the sins of the people, but for his own sin. Verse 3, because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for the people. And so in passages like Leviticus 4 or Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, it would be the one day out of the year where the high priest would come and he would sacrifice. He'd bring two goats, one of those goats he would kill. We talked about this back in Hebrews 2, the propitiation offering, where God's wrath is poured out on an animal, on a sacrifice, instead of the people. But then there would be another goat that they would lay hands on, the expiation offering, where they would lay their hands on this goat, and it was a picture of the sin of the people going on this goat. And the goat would be sent out into the wilderness, symbolizing that the sin of the people leaving the camp. And this is what the high priest would do. Leviticus 16, 9-10 says this, And the Aaron shall present the goat of which the lot fell of the Lord, and use it as the sin offering. That's, that's the one that dies. Verse 10, But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it that it may be sent away into the wilderness. So the high priest not only was chosen by God, but he was also a representative of the people before God. Not only is he a representative, but he is the one who enters God's presence. Not only does he enter God's presence, he is the only one who can make a sacrifice for the sins of the people and bring atonement on them to cover their sin. But this wasn't a one-time high priest or a one-time sacrifice. It was again and again and again and again, year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, blood being shed on behalf of the sins of the people. And now, in this moment, the author of Hebrews writes to his audience saying, there is a true and greater, a better high priest. His name is Jesus. He is the one that we look to. He is the one who makes the way for us. So what do we, what do, we do with this? I just want to give you a, a few kind of thoughts of application. Like We talk about next steps. Every time we hear the word, we want to respond to it. What, what are some next steps for us? What do we do with this passage and with these realities? Let me just offer a few ideas. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you've been around much over the last year, you hear us talk about observe, add, expand, restore. As I walk through some of these applications, next steps, I want you to take your observation glasses on over your own life and say, how does this apply to me? What needs to be added in my own pursuit of Jesus in light of this? What, what am I growing in, but I need to keep growing? I need to expand upon it. Or maybe it's something that, when you look back at your past, this is something that was, uh, you were growing in, you were thriving in, you were seeing God work in your life, but that's kind of fallen by the wayside, and you need restoration. You need to rekindle that pursuit. What do we do with these realities about the high priest. A few applications for us. First is this. God's selection of the high priest is a reminder to us of this. And I think this is so important for us this morning, church. His providential selection of the high priest reminds us that we must trust his plan. No one makes a decision to be a high priest. That's God's plan. That's God's initiative. That's God's work. No one's entitled to this role. No one gets to do it just because of who they are. That's God's chosen purposes. And for us this morning as a people, we need to remember that we're called to trust God's plan. And there's something within us, within our culture, but within our hearts that we long to be entitled. We feel like we have a right. We feel like we deserve our lives to look differently than they look. 
But God's people, they trust his plan. They trust his purposes. The second, I think, next step for us, observation for you for me is this. The, the need for a high priest who can enter into God's presence is a reminder for us that our pursuit as abiding Jesus followers is the pursuit of God's presence. We need Jesus. And in the Old Testament, the people couldn't come into God's presence. We'll talk more about this next week because of their sin. But because of Jesus, we now have a way to enter in. But even last week, Pastor Mike reminded us of this. That sometimes we try to be a people who go to God's word and pursue God's word without pursuing Jesus. That's not faithful. And sometimes we try to be a people who pursue Jesus apart from God's word. That's not faithful. We want to be a people who pursue fully, and I think that's true here. Some of us are prone to pursue obedience apart from pursuing God's presence. So practically, here's what that looks like. You do the Bible reading plan, you check off the boxes, you go to church, you do all the things, and your pursuit is wrapped around obedience more than it is being with God, knowing God, loving God. It's a trap, a tension for us to fall into legalism. But then for some of us, that's going to be on the other side. We really want God's presence, and we try to pursue the presence of Jesus and abiding, but we try to do it apart from obedience, which leads to experientialism. And this passage is a reminder to us that our pursuit is about God's presence. It's, it's to be with God, to know Him, to obey Him, to love Him, to follow Him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. This picture of the high priest also reminds us that God is worthy of sacrificial worship. The high priest, He would come, He would bring the sacrifices of the people. And though today we do not bring grain offerings or fruit offerings or animal offerings to church. Amen. Like that's a good thing. Worship of God demands sacrifice. And we live in a culture full of entertainment where we are prone to come into a gathering like this one or come into our Christian life or come into our go group, whatever it is, and again, a little bit of an entitlement. And it's just about us in that moment. The picture we see here and we see throughout the New Testament, Romans 12.1 is a great example of this, is that we are called to be living sacrifices. To come to bring worship that cost us something. That's why we give financially and generously, starting at 10% and going above. Why? Because Jesus is worthy of our greatest worship. That's why we give our time during the week. Why? Because Jesus is worthy of our greatest worship. So it's worth taking time away from good things. Maybe that might be work. Maybe that might be your kids' sports. Maybe that might be a project you want to work on the house. To be with God's people. To serve the needs of your community. To share the gospel. Why? Because worship demands sacrifice. And Jesus is worthy of our sacrifice. But lastly, I think one of the applications, next steps for us, is the high priest reminds us that we are in need of a substitute. We are in need of one who can stand in our place. We are in need of one who is chosen by God to serve the people. We are in need of one who can be fully a son of man and who can represent us as sons of men before holy, holy, holy God. We are in need of one who can enter into the holy presence of God because we cannot. And we need one who can not only offer a sacrifice for sin as high priest, but who can simultaneously be the sacrifice for sin. 
which leads to our last big idea this morning. Jesus is the better high priest. Jesus is the better high priest. He is the one chosen by God. Look at chapter 5, verse 1 again. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 4. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Look at verse 5. I love this. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest. He didn't force his way in. He didn't take it for himself. But no, he was chosen and appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. You are a priest forever, as in the order of Melchizedek. And we'll chase Melchizedek later. It's a beautiful picture. But what he's saying is, you are a priest forever, and you are a different type of priest. And not only is he chosen by God, he is fully man. He is one of us. He bears our weakness. He feels our temptation. He is fully man. But not as he fully man, he is fully God. So he can come before the presence of God. And not only is he a high priest who can offer sacrifice, he is the high priest, guess what, friends, who is the sacrifice for sin. And so this morning, as we respond and we come to the Lord's table together, we come remembering that Jesus is the better high priest. That none of us have hope apart from Jesus. That all of us this morning fall in one of two camps. This morning you're in the hard-hearted, unbelieving camp. And you need to turn to Jesus as Savior. Or, and this is where a lot of us are, you're in the ignorant and wayward camp. In this camp, you need a new heart. In this camp, you need a true heart. And the solution for both is found in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2.17, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiations for the sins of the people. In 1 Peter 2.24-25, through 25, before we take the Lord's Supper together, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Hallelujah. What a Savior. So we're going to.